the book of Ruth, and we were looking at the way the Gra learns the sort of the background to the story. And the Gaon of Vilna says that really God relates to the world in two ways, either through chesed or din. Those are the two ways. Chesed is expanding, thereby giving and giving and giving. And din is the opposite of expansion, contraction, which seems to us at least taking and taking and taking, although it's not really. It's not giving, but it feels like taking. Now, so he says that we should emulate Hashem, we should emulate God, in the same way that we should live our life with both ways of dealing uh, with the world. One with expansion or chesed, and one with din. Oh, so when do we know how to apply this one as opposed to that one? How does that work? So he explains that anything that comes to re- from spirituality, which is called ruchnius, you are supposed to follow chesed. Expand and expand and expand. Grow and grow and grow. Anything that the body desires, that is physical, you should contract, contract, contract. Clear? Yeah. Now, he says, if you don't do that, if you go the other way, and whenever your body sort of desires things and you give it to it, you just feed it. So he says, what really happens is your neshama is not going to be able to move higher and higher in the levels that it could or it should. Because the body is pulling it down. Because the body becomes stronger and stronger and stronger and draws the soul lower and lower and lower. Whereas if you limit the body and you expand the soul, then it becomes more powerful and it is allowed to lift and go higher and higher and also lifts the body with it. Okay? Now, he says that by doing chesed to his neshama, by growing spiritually, he is not only improving himself, but he's improving the world around him. It's kind of like think about the idea of, you know, your carbon footprint, right? The more you give to your body, the greater your carbon footprint is is growing, right? And so it has a negative effect on the world around you. Whereas if you limit the body and you focus more on spiritually, your, com- your carbon footprint, for, for example, is smaller and smaller and smaller, which means you're affecting negatively the world around you, the environment, less and less and less. And hence, you know, in that sense, there is a chesed that you're doing. So that, remember we were talking about whether din can be chesed, chesed can be din. It's clear that we could see that din can be chesed. Right? Because I minimize my sort of involvement in the physical world it's sort of a chesed that I do for everybody else because I, you know, leave the world in a better situation than I found it. So I'm not doing the damage that, you know, every person is supposed to do, let's say, 20% damage. I've done only 5%. So it means I made, you know, I didn't damage it as much. Here we go with regard to our situation. So he says that God blesses us that if we do so, if we live according to this way, where we limit the body, then God provides us a lot more in physicality, not only spiritually, than we need. That's, and he goes through in great detail of how he, we learn this. And he brings a, a, a Gemara, in Brachot, that says that a righteous person is judged according to his Yetzer Hatov, his good inclination. Somebody who is evil, then his Yetzer Hara is the one that brings judgments against him, because he's more dominant. Whereas somebody who is sometimes like this, sometimes like that, both of them participate in the judgment. Okay. So we see that um, 
of somebody who goes in both ways, that is sometimes he's good, sometimes he's bad, sometimes he's righteous, sometimes he sins, then God brings punishments to him to try to get him back on the good track. Right? And the punishments could be in various forms. Usually the forms are in physical punishment, not spiritual ones. Usually. That's what he gives the example. And this is where we get into this situation. So remember, he started by saying that the Jewish people are hafach pachim. They're inconsistent in the way that they are living. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, sometimes they do mitzvah, sometimes they don't. So since I can't destroy them, right, because they're not all bad, and I can't accept this behavior because they're not all good, therefore I bring yusurim or sufferings upon them. And that is the background of the story of why there is famine. Right, so the first verse that we saw was in the times where the judges were judging. It's a clue to tell us that things were not going well. Why? Because we have the plural judges. If it had the singular, right? If it's time, because there's always judgment. But if it was singular, it means it's either the evil inclination or the good inclination. If it's the evil inclination, everybody would die. If it's a good inclination, then everyone gets rewarded. But it says plural. So the plural means that it's going upon like this, like this, like this, like this. Therefore, we have a famine. That is how the grow gives us the background of what's going on. They're not completely evil. And therefore, God is trying to wake them up. Okay? So what? how is he trying to wake them up? By creating... Famine. Why famine? Right? There's lots of things he could have done. He could have given them, I don't know, pigtails. There's lots of things that God could have done. Why this particular example? Try to think about this. What do you think? What, sorry, can you rephrase the question? Rephrase it or, or restate? Re restate it. Restate, okay. So God brings suffering yeah. upon this generation so, so in the form of a famine. So why famine? Why famine, not chicken pox? Famines spread the body, chicken pox the physical. Okay. Famines is capable, like, uh, you know, if you believe in the land of famine, like, you can... There, there's ways around it. Okay, good. I, I like that. There is. Have you ever heard of the principle, mida keneged mida, measure for measure. So there is an idea that the Gra is saying that in this that the punishment fits the offense. So since we know what the punishment is, we try to go backwards and figure out what the offense is because there is a direct correlation between them. So there is similarity. Or people were not giving enough. That is, God gives in order that you should give. When you are holding on to what God is giving you by not giving it, right? You are creating a famine here. So God says, I, I'm giving it to you and you're not giving, then I'm not going to give. So you understand that you are supposed to keep giving. That's the idea. So is that, is that related to what we mentioned yesterday with uh, Emi Melech leaving mm -hmm. because he was, he was miserly? Exactly. Exactly. It says they did not, that's what he said, they did not have mercy over for the poor people. Ki kol ma shenoten Hashem leze yoter mizehu kreshir hachem al chavero. For whatever God gives us, He gives us more than what we need in order that we will have mercy on other people and give them. Share our wealth. Help them. Two billion dollars is more than enough money to share. Well, I don't know. It's kind of hard. I only made a hundred million this year. I met, there was a guy who I sat with and I was talking to him about a third party. And we said, well, what do you think? This person can, you know, step up and help us? 
He goes, oh, he had a tough year. He, you know, he's like, he's only making five million this year. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That must be tough. You know, I don't know what to do at the end of the month. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta scrounge around for change, pocket change, because I only made five million dollars this year. And the guy was like feeling bad for him. I'm, like, I'm sorry. What world are you people living in? So, okay. So here is the idea is that what God gives, he gives so that we will help other people. And since they didn't, then the din was activated. Right? God is giving, 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 unending, and you're not doing what you're supposed to do. At some point, it switches. It's like you're not giving. We're going to close the faucet. Now you're starting to pay attention. Like, well, why is it coming in? And you start answering, asking questions like, well, what happened? So, what happened is you didn't do what you were supposed to do with what you, the bounty that Hashem gave you. That is not only in money. It's in wisdom, it's talent, your time. Right? I mean, if you, let's say, become you know, a great rabbi, but you don't, you're not willing to teach others, then that's what I need you for. It's not only you. You have to give. I gave you my mind to be able to learn. I gave you the time to learn. You should share. You should teach. You should get it out. Okay. So that is the idea of why there was famine. Okay? Now let's get back to text for text with Rashi and the rest of our crew. And today we're actually going to move ahead to verse number two. So just so that we understand the way the, the, the text tells us in verse one. So in the days of when the judges were judging, Rashi tells us we're talking about a historical period. Right? The Gras says it's not really talking about an historical period. It's talking about the relationship between God and this generation happens to be in a historical time, time frame, but it is describing to us the relationship between God and the Jewish people, which is similar to Rabbi Novadia. And then we have the Ibn Ezra, because we didn't do the Ibn Ezra yet. We're doing multiple interpretations of each verse. The Ibn Ezra says that since the word Shafat Shoftim, so it says that because the judges were judging, famine came into the land. The fact that they had to start giving judgment, it means that people were not doing what they were supposed to do. And since they were not doing what they're supposed to do, judges had to get involved and say, clean your room, brush your teeth, go to bed, go, you know. Then it means at some point you're like, listen, why do I have to tell you what to do? So a man from Bethlehem, Yehuda, left and went to a place called Zdei Moab. Since the verse says Ish, what does the English say? It calls a man. What does it call him? No, before the name, verse 1. And a man left. No, no, just read the beginning. A man went from Bethlehem. Went. A man. The Hebrew word is Ish. Rashi tells us that the word Ish is reference that the guy is big time. When the Torah talks about an ish, it means this is somebody who is a very important person. It's not just a regular Joe Schmo. And Rashi says he was a very, very wealthy person. And why did he leave, Rashi says? Because he didn't, he had gotten tired of giving money to poor people who were knocking on his door. Help me out. I've had enough. So he moves to Sdei Moab. And that's why he was punished. Okay. I want to share with you the Malbim. Because the Malbim is a very, very important commentator on uh, Tanakh, on the Hebrew Bible. And he has very, very interesting comments to make about what we're reading and we're going to sort of look at them in how all the different commentators are looking at the passage. So he says that the first verse is telling us the reason why Avimelech 
should be Elimelech, is leaving Eretz Yisrael lechutz la'aretz. And you tell me if he's faulting Elimelech or not. Because here's what it says. Since this was at the time where the Shoftim were in charge, and there is no Melech in Israel, there was no king, and every priority, everyone did whatever they wanted, whatever was fit in their eyes, and there was no one judge for all of Israel, and there were many, many different judges, so people did whatever they wanted, and they were not afraid of the judges, so therefore, he left. He left. Now, how is the Malbim learning? Was Avimelech, Elim, sorry, Elimelech correct in leaving or incorrect in leaving? According to the Malbim. What? For what? He didn't say that he's not giving enough. That was Rashi. The Malbim did not say he wasn't giving enough. What the Malbim says is that this was a historical period, this t- time frame was when the judges were judging, not one judge. There is no king. The judges did not have enough power to be able to control the society. People decided for themselves what they wanted. And he continues and says, there was famine, and poor people went to the the wealthy and forced them to give them food, and if they didn't get it, they would take by force. Robin Hood. Since there was no king to threaten them. So does he fault Elimelech or not? In that reading, I don't think he faults him. Because he says what? Because if you know he was in danger as a wealthy person, that even if he didn't, if he, even if he wanted to give, like if he didn't get enough, correct, people would just rob him. You can't blame him. So far in Malbim. We'll keep going. So the Malbim at this stage of the game is learning that the, the verse is telling us not that the people were doing something wrong, that there were many judges, there isn't centralized authority. When there's no centralized authority, people behave in sort of somewhat of uh, anarchy, some level of anarchy. And that anarchy caused the famine. I'm adding that. And because there was a famine and anarchy, poor people went to the wealthy and said, give us food. And if they didn't give enough or didn't give how many, how much they thought they should give, they would simply take by force. But there was a judge of that era. Like, uh, yes, that was a, an era. era. Correct. It is the period before Shaul HaMelech, before Saul. For a period of 360 years. 354, I think. Yeah. After Yeshua, they come into the land of Israel, they conquer the land, divide it among the tribes, then it's the period of judges. Okay? Okay. Continues the... Um, and how did the Ibn Ezra learn? Do you remember? What caused the famine? They weren't giving enough. The judging, that's Rashi. Oh. The judging of the judges. That's what he says. That the judging of the judges is that through them, famine came to the land. So the question is, what does that mean? Does that mean that they were doing, making bad decisions? Or the fact that they had to get involved to make decisions in the first place. There's two ways to look at it. I'll leave it. So you have to try to figure out, is that like Rashi or like the Malbim? So the idea is, in this class, to try to keep it in mind, the different ways that they're looking at it, and keep it together. Like that's your challenge. Right? So Rashi says that this was before kings, and there were judges, and... Here, a wealthy person left because he didn't want to give enough to the poor. Clearly, it's very simple. He is faulting um, Elimelech. The Malbim comes and says, look, the famine came, since it's a bit of anarchy, 
people were forcing the rich people to come. So he continues and says that he left since he was wealthy and he was afraid that the poor people will attack him and take everything that he would have. And therefore he went to Moab. But he didn't move to Moab forever. He just went there until the anarchy would pass. Okay? And we see that it says the fields of Moab. Why does it say fields of Moab, not the cities of Moab? Right, he, he didn't want to move to Moab. His point was not, I'm moving to, you know what, times are tough. I'm moving to Paris. He said, nah. That wasn't his mahalim. He wasn't immigrating because he was looking for a better life. He was simply trying to preserve his money and his life. And so he moves to, in the middle of nowhere, and he lives there, and he lives in the field. Could it be that he went to the fields of Moab because he was afraid that if he went to the cities, it would just be the same problem as before, where opposed to in the fields, like, you know, there might be, there's less people and potentially more food, so it wouldn't be, he wouldn't have the same concern of poor people wanting his money? Well, no, because Moab has a king. The Moabites have kings. It was a mon monarchical society. They didn't have a, it's not like a tribal confederacy at this time. Mm -hmm. So, because we, how do we know that? Because you could ask, like, how do you know that? If you read the book of Judges, sometimes there's a judge who leads battle against either the Ammonites or Moabites. Mm -hmm. And they have a king. Yeah. So. Okay? So he says that he went there, you could see that he's not moving in the cities, he didn't get a room in the Waldorf Astoria. He's not living the plush life. He's living in the field, probably in a tent or a hut, whatever it is, until you know, things calm down in Eretz Israel so he can come back. Is he faulting him at this stage? No. So then what would be the problem that comes up? He did something wrong in the fields. So let's see, we'll read a little bit and then you'll see. So read verse 2. Machlon, Kilion, disease and destruction. That's the what's what that those are what the two words mean. Do you think he would call his kids that? So one, they, there's multiple ways of understanding at least machlon. Kilion, there's only one way. Machlon, and simply is could mean disease from machala, and kilion is destruction. There's another way that we're going to see later on. Machlon means forgiveness, but I don't want to get into that yet. We will bezat Hashem get to that. So he has two sons, machlon and kilion. Okay, forget the name. Ephrata, Ephratim, they are from a very noble family from the city of Bethlehem. And they come to Zdei Moav, Sham, and they were there, right? That's how the verse ends. Tribe. Yeah, that's the tribe. Yeah, that's the tribe. No, not yet. It hasn't been split off yet. And then they came to the field of Moab, and there they remained. There they remained, Vihiyusham. Right, Vihiyusham. So then what happens? Look at verse 3. Look means somebody read. That's what I mean by that. It's a euphemism for somebody read. I don't care who. Even if it's Binyamin. Binyamin wants to read, that's fine too. No, he's Binyamin. You're Ben. But if you want Binyamin, you can rest, arm wrestle him for it. I don't know if Naomi's husband died and she was left with her two sons and married Moabite. Wait, wait, that's four? That's verse four. Good, you read three, but no, but you went and they married. Verse three, right? Okay. He dies. 
Why does he die? Oh. So if we learn that his death was his punishment, then what do we say to the Malbim? If you don't fault him for leaving, why did he get punished? Excellent. Very good. Why did he get punished? So the Malbim would have to tell us what? How did he die? He died. No, he doesn't say that. He says he died. And he died. So, okay. So, this is sort of what the Malbim is preempting in the next line that I'm going to read to you. He says it on an earlier part. So I wanted you to read the next verses so you know why he's saying what he's saying. So he says like this. A man, so he was worried that his money was going to take, uh, they're going to take his money. So he moved. All right? But what do you see? What, did it, what does the verse say? Vayelech ish mi ben lechem. A man left from Bet Lechem. How many people left? Just him. What's the problem with that? No, it was just him. Is he the only wealthy person that left? Yeah, but that's the, that's the idea. Him, which is the main part of the family. Like he's got the money, he's got everything. So they leave. But did other people leave? Was he the only wealthy person in Bethlehem? No, there are other wealthy people. But the verse says that only he left. That's how the Malbim answers why he was punished. It wasn't that he left, he was the only one that left? He was the only one that left. His motivation for leaving is not wrong. But you're the only guy that's leaving. All the other wealthy people have the same motivation of leaving. But are they leaving? No. They're staying. They're willing to take that chance. Why are they willing to take the chance? I mean, there must be some merit to staying then. If he's What's the merit? Figure that out. Correct. Correct. So what? Excellent. Exactly. That's where we're going. So why? What's the merit? To hear what he said. Leaving Eretz Israel. Where is Bethlehem? Bethlehem. Bethlehem is where it is today. In the Yehuda, the Shomron. It's in Eretz Israel. It's areas that we have friends who live there, our cousins. But that's what I meant. Yeah, I, I know. That's why I said, God forbid. I'm from another country. No, no, you're you're fine. I just I'm you're being politically correct. I'm being halachically correct. Right? It's part of Eretz Israel. So. Does that mean that everyone that left Israel? No, was it's by uh, by the Jordan River. What? Does that mean that everyone that left Israel was punished? So that's the question. We're going to get to that. But in his case, he's the only one that's leaving. Nobody else left. There's a famine. Yes, rich people are getting attacked. Let's say, but they're not leaving Eretz Israel. They're not. They'd rather lose all their money and live in Eretz Israel than have their money and not live in Eretz Israel. The people who live in Elam, which is technically not Israel, do they, do they have to keep um, today's... Shabbos? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Elam's not true. Elam's technically is in Israel. But I don't think so. I don't think so because there are areas that were... That were, that were no, no. I don't think so, but it was conquered by. Um, there are certain parts of the land of Israel that were conquered by uh, the uh, returnees when they came back. No, 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 no. From. No, 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 no. Yeah, biblical time. In the Babylonian exile. When they came back. So. It, it might fall under that, but I'll have to, I'll ask, uh, we'll ask 
Um, Rabbi Zweig, you'll know. But I don't think so. I don't think so. That they keep two days. I think it's one. Okay. So the Malbim says he was the only one that left. All the other wealthy people did not join in this decision to leave. And we see that the, the wife and the sons of Avimelech didn't want to leave. I don't know how he sees it yet, but we will get to it. Because they left because the father left. They didn't have a choice. Nobody asked them. Because they were kids. So then he says the following. This is going to be a little bit, of, I'm, I'm sort of debating to get into it or not. Maybe we shouldn't for now. Let's leave it for now and we'll continue. So, then it says the name, why is it telling us the name of the person? Why do we need to know his name? Yeah, why? What do we need his name? Which means, my God is king. My God is king. So the Malbim says that everybody knew him. And they knew him by name. So it was like a big sign. Everybody knew him. Everybody knew him. And him and his children and his wife, they were all, you know, the upper echelon of society. They were all known. Everybody knew who they were. So he says, the Malbim, that he was afraid of the masses, that they would come to him. And he was afraid. He says, and this is the reason why he was punished. Because by leaving, it weakened the beliefs the heart, the hopes of the Jewish people. If you are a Jewish leader and you do something that may save your own skin, but by your decision, by doing what you're doing, causes the heart of the Jewish people to miss a beep, a beat, you're going to get punished. He was the leader of the generation, big guy, right? one of the leading lights of the generation, and he's leaving, and all the people that weren't leaving were like, oh my God, Abi Melech and his family are leaving. What are we going to do? That's why he received such a serious punishment. Death. Questions? Comments? Now, the Malbim says his leaving Eretz Israel was, I'm using the words of, of the Malbim, Chilul Hashem, desecration of God's name. He desecrated God's name by leaving. Because he should have stayed and trusted God to protect him. No? Trust God. And if somebody that big is leaving, you know, what will people who have lower levels of imuna, of connection to God, what, what are they going to say? Right? And therefore, this was a serious, serious step. So does the Malbim fault Ali Melech? Yes. For the same thing that Rashi says, or no? No, for two different reasons. For two different reasons. Now we're going to look at the Ibn Ezra. The Ibn Ezra says, the man's name is Elimelech. So says 
אלי או קיילי הוא שמו של הקדוש ברוך הוא. So that is the, one of the names of Hashem. שלא ראוי, שלא ראוי. That actually was um, appropriate to him. And then he talks about the names of the two sons, but I don't want to get into it just yet, of the two sons. Um, now, the gra on this, the gra says that he left to Moab because, like Rashi, because he, he was stingy. Sarut Ain, right? He didn't want to give. And he says, and he went to the Moabites because that is their, that's how they live. That's the type of society they are. They don't like to give charity either. Was, he was looking around. He could have moved to Greece. He could have moved to Rome. He could have moved anywhere he wanted. He chose Moab. Ah, you say, but that's far. Okay, because the Amon, you could go to Rabat Amon. So instead of going to the right, you go to the left. Right? It's close enough. So no, he went to Ma because he was looking for a society that was similar to his sort of <coughs> way of looking at the world. What? Uh, okay. Yeah. So he says that he came there and they essentially became like the Moabites. His children, even though that his family may not have been like him, they were influenced by the Moabites. Okay. Vayamat Elimelech. And Elimelech dies. And he doesn't really explain why he died. He doesn't. He just doesn't comment on that. So he has to say, why does it say Elimelech ish Naomi? The, the, because he says he was the main part. The rest of the story is about Nomi and, uh, you know, whatever else is going on. But he was the, the main part of the family. And once he's gone, sort of made it very, very tough for his widow and her sons. Okay? Questions? No. Good. Now we get to the two sons. Machlon v'chilion. Machlon v'chilion are two names that the Ibn Ezra says the following. It's a very nice Ibn Ezra. It's a very interesting idea. He says, according to the Gemara, their names and the, the Drash says that they had two different names. They have Yoash Vesaraf. And since they married Moabite women, right? He says that was their names were changed. Get it? No, no. Why not? Good. Tell me why not. So we, we can learn together. So they, so they changed their names? Yeah. Or, so, uh, I, mean, I think I'm just going to clear. Who, who, who changed who changed their names? The text says their name was Machlon v'Kilion. Yeah. If we learn Machlon and Kilion means death, or sorry, disease and destruction. Right. Okay. So if, let's say that's the, what the names are. The question is very obvious. What father would call his kids by those two names? What father would call his kids, you know, ugly and uglier? Or dumb and dumber? Nobody. So it means what? That they had a different name. Oh, okay. What was their difference? So they had a different name. Okay. So if they had a different name, why do they have these two names? That means they were bad, and so they got labeled Exactly. So what were they doing that was so bad? Destruction? Yeah. What are their names? Disease and destruction, let's say. So the answer is no, no, look. It, it says here, it says they married Moabite women. They married non-Jewish women. You're not allowed to do that. And so they died. In verse 5. 
Get it? Okay. We'll stop because there's mincha. We'll continue tomorrow, Bezad Hashem. Thank you for coming. Looking forward to continuing with you.